Good morning, good afternoon, whatever the case may be. Uh, welcome uh, to the Sure Workflow webinar series. Uh, I am Ben, and I'm joined here with uh, Jen Liang Shabu and Jason Waffle, part of our pro market development team. And we are going to talk about migrating to digital wireless. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this topic because we got some really smart people in the room today. And uh, I know we have a lot of regulars that join our webinars, and we thank you for that, and some new faces as well. So uh, we're going to talk about everything from the whole process of switching from an analog workflow to a digital workflow, uh, some of the tips and tricks and pitfalls, uh, some things that have improved, maybe some things that you have to watch out for, uh, and so forth. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, please put all, any questions you have in the chat, and uh, we'll try to get to those and answer them by the end of the webinar. Uh, we definitely want to try to, you know, touch base on things that uh, interest you. Uh, I think it's of, of utmost importance because uh, as you probably know, uh, this Monday, uh, July 13th was the, the last day for the uh, the 600 megahertz transition. So uh, hopefully you've migrated uh, your wireless microphones out of the 600 megahertz to something uh, legal. And uh, if not, we can certainly help you with that. Um, kind of a shameless plug, we do have our switch to digital promotion, which we'll talk a little bit more about later, where if you are interested in upgrading to a digital wireless product from Sure, uh, you can do that without even sending anything in. We're just going to give you a straight up discount uh, for making the switch to digital. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our, our guest today, uh, which we're very fortunate to have. Um, First off, we have uh, James Joyce uh, from Carnegie Hall. Um, he's part of the uh, Local One IATSE and uh, does a lot of the design installation uh, and uh, kind of the IT-based things at, at Carnegie. We also have uh, Dave Chessman, uh, who does a lot, wears a lot of different hats, including RF coordinator, system designer, and A2, uh, all system stuff. Uh, so uh, Dave's uh, a great resource to have, and we're lucky to have him here. Uh, Brooke Schroeder, uh, the owner of Frequency Coordination Group. Uh, they do obviously a lot of frequency coordination and in huge RF projects at the highest level and so forth. And also, last but not least, Kirk Powell uh, from ATK, who's uh, again done a lot of uh, things with wireless microphones and 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 so forth. Um, maybe you guys want to just kind of go around a little bit and uh, you know introduce yourself and kind of some of the some of the projects you may may have worked on or that you like to share. Uh, maybe start with you, uh, JJ. You get to my mute button. Sorry about that. There it is. So, uh, so uh, many years in the industrial world, world working with uh, Sure products and uh, alike. And uh, in the last five years, I landed at Carnegie Hall and uh, have had the fortunate opportunity there to to be there during the uh, end of analog life, I guess we could call it, and uh, transition to digital. Um, I'm a, a ones and zeros guy, as you had mentioned before. And uh, really my key part in the whole transition was to aid in building the networks and infrastructure that was required to support, um, you know, Shore, Dante, the whole, the whole nine yards, uh, the control networks and build stable platforms so that uh, these systems were able to operate reliably. Um, you know, it is uh, Carnegie Hall and it is a high pressure environment to get it right the first time. There's no second chance. Not to say that there is second chances in other parts of show business, but uh, the the pressure level is pretty high there uh, to, to get it right and to be confident in the systems that we have. So, um, you know, making sure all the networking is right. We've chatted before about the fact that in the AV industry, uh, we all need to go back and get IP and, and IT degrees because it is migrating that way very fast uh, in audio, video, lighting, every department there is, automation, uh, everything has an IP address now. So uh, that's the one thing that uh, fortunately with my, my IT background, it was, a, it was a good fit and so far so great. Um, you know, we'll get into some more details about that later, but uh, that kind of sums it up uh, from my perspective. Uh, I've been doing corporate and broadcast audio for a couple, couple some decades now. Uh, recently, project manager, audio project manager and uh, system designer for Rock, Christmas at Rockefeller Center. Uh, I was the RF coordinator on five of the Democratic uh, presidential debates so far in this cycle. Um, 
countless various corporate shows, uh, Intercom and RF on a bunch of the auto show circuit and just more other things that I can even list off. That's awesome. Um, thank you. Uh, Kirk, how about yourself? Um, I work at ATK Audio Tech and uh, we primarily focus on um, live spe TV special event live shows. Uh, they are big and bold. My big show every year is Super Bowl, which I've worked with Brooks on several of. And just managing something like that is quite the task and everything. Um, as far as the other things, I help support and design uh, systems for that and develop the new technology like Dante that we're going to talk about today into um, our events. Excellent. And Brooks? Uh, I own Frequency Coordination Group. Uh, we do frequency coordination for a um, variety of different uh, events, NBA All-Star Games, large music festivals, um, large corporate events and industrials uh, for the tech industry, automotive industry, uh, and then special events throughout TV. Uh, I've worked with almost everybody on this panel in some sort of thing, either together or coordinating with or um, for. Um, and, you know, I'm excited to have people move to digital because it makes my job as a coordinator much easier when we start to get into big events. So I think this is gonna be a great, great talk. Yeah, really looking forward to it. Um, I, I think we'll bring it way back and just kind of discuss, like obviously all of you have been working with uh, wireless for a number of years now, and um, uh, we have a lot of experience with the analog domain, but maybe uh, we'd like to talk a little bit about uh, your first kind of foray into the digital wireless realm and when that happened, um, you know, what your experience was, uh, how long ago was that, you know? Uh, but we've had some products out for a while, like ULXD and others that kind of uh, broke the barriers into digital wireless from analog. And it'd, it'd be cool to kind of hear your your first experiences with uh, the new quote unquote digital wireless. Can you take I it? guess um, I'll jump in. Go ahead. Um, the, we used it for the first time, um, golly, three or four Super Bowls, was it that long ago? We, we used to say Super Bowl, what was my first experience. And that was interesting because um, we started migrating to Dante about four, five years ago uh, at Super Bowl. So being able to integrate the digital wireless with the Dante straight into the system was a big benefit. When you, instead of having to run cable, you can just click a blue dot and somebody else has got it. That was a huge step for me. Um, in creating uh, a seamless system. Uh, though, as JJ pointed out earlier, you really do have to be an IT guy now. I mean, I, I do more IT work than I do audio work now, and that's something I didn't expect 20 years ago. But the upside is that, man, the system is incredibly flexible. Uh, so I can route, it, you get that last second request of, hey, I need the global spare over here because we're going to use it for this. Okay, well, then here you go. Click, boom, it's there. It's It really helps being versatile and flexible with the unknowns that crop up in these really big shows. And uh, just curious, Kirk, what was uh, prior to the Dante? I mean, were you just running you know, lines all over the place, uh, analog uh, lines, or what was the process? We've been, doing, we've been doing network distribution there for a while. We were using primarily CobraNet. But the downside of that is that you're very channel limited, and you, we were having to run so many different networks and cross-patch between the networks. So we had a, a room that all the networks came to, and we were literally, there were XLR cables everywhere, cross-patch, okay, we got to get this to this, we got to get this to that. And everything and moving up to the Dante with the higher channel counts allowed us to make it one network. And so that patch room kind of went away. And that was a really nice uh, upgrade to what we do. Excellent. Excellent. I think for myself, uh, first digital wireless was the ULXD. I had a corporate client that wanted 
it was, I think, 64 RF in lower Manhattan. And at the, mo at the same time, they had to be encrypted, which fortunately the ULXDs had come out not long before and made that a possibility. Because until then, there really was no option to cram that many wireless into lower Manhattan and have it be encrypted. I could, uh, uh, I, oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, mine's short and sweet. So uh, we have been, uh, you know, I, I kind of travel with the same group of technicians uh, in the shows that I do. And we had been dabbling in ULXD and yeah, we'll, we'll use some Dante and whatnot. But I will say that uh, with the latest deployment a, a couple of years ago at Carney, we're full, you know, fully immersed in it. And it's just, it's pretty wild how flexible it is how uh how much you know it really helps what we do how quiet it is uh the whole show managing and being able to swap frequencies on the fly without having to walk out on stage and say here's another microphone you know is a powerful tool so um that's when we have really dove into all the feature and functionality of it go ahead brooks sorry man no problem uh my first hands-on use for a, a large show i'd say it was 2013 um and it was ulxd we were in downtown los angeles a very wonderful rf environment um and we we basically ran out of spectrum um that was usable using uhfrs at the time um and the the crash truck from the network had ulxds um and i not having a lot of experience with them being a ULX product, I was kind of hesitant to use it, but I was really surprised. We dropped them right on top of a low level DTV station, no problems, no artifacts in it. Um, gained ourselves, you know, six megs of usable spectrum. Uh, and it was, that was when my eyes kind of opened. I was like, okay, this is, this is good. This is a, this is better than what I thought. Um, and it was kind of amazing to just all of a sudden gain spectrum in downtown LA for microphones. That's that's super awesome. I mean, uh, I'm hearing a couple of recurring themes here um, and kind of leads us to our next question about uh, exploring why did we switch from, you know, digital from analog. And I'm hearing a little bit, you know, about uh, the Dante, of course, and encryption, uh, maybe channel density. Uh, were there any other features that were like, hey, I, I got to use digital for this because it's the only thing that's going to work or something that was really made the switch like mandated for you guys? Uh, I'd be curious about. Um, I would say from a coordination side of it, I've been pushing a lot of the um, other uh, people who are bringing microphones into the larger shows, the industrial shows or the music festivals to switch to digital, uh, purely just to be able to provide them clean frequencies for the amount of wireless that they're needing. And I think that goes across the board from a large industrial where you might be setting up multiple manufacturers booths and they all want to have eight to 10 microphones to a music festival where each band needs to have, you know, backline mics and ears and the numbers grow each year. You know, a lot of times back, you know, 10 years ago to industrial, you might have a booth that had two microphones. That booth nowadays might have 12. Um, so kind of telling everybody to switch to digital allows me with the channel density, uh, being able to co-channel it because of the lower power you can run digital at from room to room and hall to hall. It just opens up the ability for me to not give people bad news um, when they're trying to set up their booth. Mm -hmm. The um, I push or I encourage the Axiom Digital for the full spectrum tuning. That to me is a co when I'm coordinating is hugely valuable to walk in and oh we need more frequencies or oh by the way there's a whole nother show next door. We thought we told you about that. And now I have to, okay, great. Now I have to call the rental shop, order different equipment. It makes my life much more straightforward. That's a great point. Yeah, the Axiom Digital, uh, the wideband tuning is awesome. I mean, it's pretty much in the US. It's the one range that covers predominantly most of the spectrum that's available to us after after the auction. So no more wondering which J or G range I have. Just grab it or order one from the rental house and, and you got it in your, in your lap. Um, 
How about you, JJ? Um, any well, features we'll, that were kind of like, hey, we got to have this for Carnegie. This is this is a must have. Uh, we need to upgrade out of our analog stuff because, you know. Well, the, the the first thing is is I think the analog stuff that was in there might have might have been put in by Andrew Carnegie himself, but uh, <laughs> uh, Carnegie actually is the right way to say it. But uh, it, you know, it it had done its time, and it was also sure wireless, and it did a great job, and it held up, and it just speaks to the brand of of you know how old the stuff was. And then of course we were getting into this whole frequency um, sale and whatnot that we needed to make a transition. Um, but uh, really, the the features, the complete feature set, right, right down to you know batteries, um, you know, having the charging stations built into the racks, you know, this stuff is not. It's the only thing that's missing from Carnegie is the the truck, right? Because we change shows every day uh, is a new show, and uh, it's typically load in, rehearse, show, load out, all within you know 18 hours. Uh, so the gear is not always in place. It comes off the stage, it gets reallocated to a different area, a different show, moving around. So the idea of being able to package it just like it is from a rental house, but still have the reliability of an installation, uh, it was a, was a big win. So like I said, right down to the batteries are in the charging ports and they're always ready to go. We're not worried about, oh, where's the double A's? Um, the uh, the show link feature is, is big because like I said before, uh, the idea and I don't want to put any RF coordinators out of, out of work or anything. And we do have a few gentlemen on staff that do handle the RF specifically. Um, but the idea of being able to make those adjustments and changes while the show is happening and not have to, you know, break stride of, you know, some world-class performance because all of a sudden we're getting hits because we are, you know, just uptown of Broadway. So there is lots of noise uh, happening in the area. And that idea of being able to manage that uh, quietly uh, is a big win because, you know, although our uh, us as technicians are one of the most important parts of the show, they don't always like to see us, right? We want to try and – it's a good day when nobody knows we're there, you know, and that's an advantage uh, to having that show link control and having all the handles on everything that we're able to have with workbench and whatnot, and right down to the simple user interface. You don't need to have a computer running to get into the, you know, under the hood. You can get to it through the interface, you know, maybe not all the details, but you can you can make things happen that way. And uh, that's, a, that's a big win. So that's really kind of why we went that direction because of those uh, advantages. Sweet. How about um, uh, maybe uh, from a pr production standpoint or as far as, um, you know, the actual audio itself, um, the audio quality, I mean, what uh, was there a perceived difference between the analog audio quality and, and the digital uh, and, and the migration when you guys have switched or your, your clients have switched? Uh, I'll jump in and say that, yes, um, for good and bad, though, I think that the the transition from analog to digital has also been, uh, besides the RF side of it, the difficult side of it, because microphones sound different. You know, you have people who are used to a UHF R58 sounding this way. And when you get more audio bandwidth and better quality audio out of it, it changes the, di the dynamic of how people hear things and what happens to that signal. Um, and, you know, now that most shows have switched completely over to digital, I would say it's less of a problem. But, you know, during the infancy of digital wireless, there was a, a big fight for the RF technician of cane staging and how you run the microphones, what this microphone sounds like to this microphone. Um, the, the delay difference, which causes phasing in the TV world of an analog microphone, digital microphone. Um, so the fact that everyone's now moving over to digital and it's been embraced so well, it, it it takes out so many different problems from the analog of noise and induction to that. And then our little mixture in the middle of two types of technologies to full digital, you know, that I think not being the audio guy on the show as the RF guy, it, it helps me solve a lot of problems because people aren't hearing induction from guitars and things like that, that it's an RF problem. It's an RF problem. You know, you're getting audio out of it or you're not getting audio out of it. 
Yeah, that brings up to a good point. Um, we talked about gene staging and such, and what you, what you mentioned, Brooks. Um, I think, uh, and in our experience as a, from the team, um, there's kind of a, a new frontier of uh, setting up your gain staging for, for digital wireless versus analog. And sometimes it's under, misunderstood. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the traditional gain staging from an analog perspective, as well as the new ULXD or Axiom uh, gain staging and mic offset and, and that type of thing. Uh, maybe you've experienced some things out in the field like that. Um, I, I have, um, and I think there was a lot of misconception when um, Accent Digital first came out with mic offset versus gain and, and what the stages did and how to use it. Um, and that it's been a learning curve for all users of the microphones of, you know, we're not really dealing with an analog gauge stage anymore. There's not an output gain stage like there was in an analog microphone. It, everything happens inside the capsule. So you, we have to think of it that way. And I, we're not used to that. You know, we're, there's multiple places where you could have clipped or compressed an analog microphone. There's really one now with a digital microphone. Um, so just, you know, people getting used to saying, oh, we're going to run our handhelds at minus eight, so we don't clip the handheld and saying, well, we're not gonna do that with these, we're gonna run them this way and this is why, and just trying to learn and, and figure out how these gain stages now work differently. Um, and, and I think it's critical when people use new systems that they take the time to do that. Um, I, I, we were doing a music festival a couple years ago and there was a guitar tech who was just completely clipping the front end of his Axiom Digital because he was setting them up like an analog microphone and it, it didn't work and he hated them. He's like, they just don't sound right. And I was like, well, let me show you some things. And then he was like, this is amazing. I can hear, you know, I, I can hear the, the, the fingers on the frets now being picked up on the pickup I couldn't hear before. And so it's the learning curve of that I, is it's still happening. Um, uh, the other thing that I think is interesting with the digital microphones, because Dante or Maddie or anything built into it is how the, that gain stage affects the digital side of things. And different manufacturers, it happens differently. Sure, it's all linked together. A Sennheiser microphone, there's a different outputs for each one of them. Sony, there's different outputs for each one of them. So it's um, learning about how that works and then working with your you know, system administrator like you know, Kirk on a show and say, you know, if I do this, how's that gonna affect your digital stream and, and how do we wanna do this and where do we go? It's just a, an important conversation to have with the production team um, moving forward and as we transition with these new products. Anyone else? Uh, so that's cool. Uh, as we uh, as we mentioned, or Brooks mentioned the 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 mic offset thing. I mean, traditionally, you know, you have a gain on your on your transmitter or a sensitivity control, as some manufacturers call it. And you know, you know the deal. You have to set that properly, just like a, a microphone on a preamp. And if you set it incorrectly uh, in the analog domain, you can clip it before it even gets transmitted over the air. And I think the workflow from what we've seen is that. Uh, so many, so many people are used to doing that. They would treat the mic offset as a, as a regular, just sensitivity or, or gain control. And uh, what is unknown is that that conversion has already happened because it's taken care of that. And it's hard to believe that you know the, the microphone just automatically sets the gain appropriately, and I don't have to do that anymore. And you feel like you need to do something like you traditionally have done for many years. And uh, we see some uh, improper gain structure from that. Uh, that type of uh, workflow just based on habit, you know, uh, on using analog microphones in the past and to the new digital. But what do you mean I don't have to set the gain? It just works. And, uh, uh, you know, people like they're a little bit hesitant to trust that until, you know, they get familiar with the workflow. And it was like Brooks was saying, you know, you, you get familiar with the gear and how it works and so forth. Um, yeah. yeah, real quick, I want to I want to jump in and getting getting to understand that, you know, the gain stage on an AD is is not the same gain stage as it was before and where that comes in and how, how it's basically you're getting all the information you're going to get to the receiver and then you're picking what part of that information you're getting out of the receiver and, and so when you're clipping that you're you're not necessarily clipping the microphone anymore you're clipping the output and and how how you you know if, if you're clipping the output and you go and you put a pad in on a belt pack for a guitar it's never going to stop clipping the output. You can turn it all the way down. You're going to clip that output. And that's the, the main takeaway. And people 
just have to get used to understanding that that's where your gain stage is, not where it used to be, kind of thing. So I just clarify, you know, how that came about when I was working with that gentleman. Absolutely. Um, one of the things about, at least with Axiom Digital, um, you can you can see right on the receiver if it's clipping and the red light will come on and let you know that your audio is clipping. And, you know, historically in the analog domain, you'd have to go to the transmitter or get it back from the talent to adjust that. Uh, in the digital domain, you can simply just turn it right down on the receiver uh, right there when, that's right in front of you and, and fix that and fix that structure and, and uh, not have to go out and get that pack or that guitar pack back from that from the client. So uh, it's, a, it's a welcome change, I think, uh, to have more accessibility and just a little bit more ease of use uh, and friendly. Um, maybe pivot a little bit about, you know, the implementation, you know, working with analog and especially antenna systems. Uh, you know, we have a lot of antenna distribution and uh, different paddles and types of antennas and, and that sort of thing. Uh, curious about uh, your experiences with the migration from using, you know, an analog setup for antennas to, to digital and uh, what has changed, maybe what has stayed the same, uh, things that are maybe different um, and discuss a little bit about antenna setup. Having the option of quadversity on the Axiant Digital is really useful. And there's, I still have applications where I want a distributed system, dressing rooms, outdoors, you know, secondary zones. But I have found there are time and place for both. Yeah, I would say um, some of the interesting things I've learned with using a, an analog distributed system with the new microphones is um, the microphones are more forgiving um, with an analog antenna system uh, than they used to be with analog. Because you can have, you know, if you're balanced and you're not, you know, over amplifying your entire system, the receivers are, do, they do a better job of, of locating their frequency, figuring what sound they have and, and using it. Versus before you would have to, you know, gain this zone up or down depending on how you walked it and how it's penetrating through walls or where you're gonna go. Um, one of the really interesting things I found is when you're using fiber um, antenna systems, uh, you have to be a lot, you have to be more careful, I guess, not the right way to say that, but um, how those zones interact with each other because the latency that the fiber system puts into the, the signal will cause the digital receiver to mute. Um, it, the, the squelch setting sets in because it can't line up the ones and zeros from, you know, this is a millisecond before this one. And that was a, a hard learned lesson at, I think, three o'clock in the morning at Disney on a roof trying to figure out, okay, why do we keep dropping the microphone right here and everything's fine? And then digging into that reason and talking to sure engineers about this is what's happening. So, um, it, I, I think in some ways it makes it easier to think about. It's, you know, the microphones work better, um, but when you get more complicated, you have to think about things more too, so. Excellent. Um, as far as antenna systems go, and what we're on that, on that topic, um, how about like comparison from the analog uh, workflow of um, range and output power? I mean, the experiences with the differences, we see a lot of, um, of the users that are new to digital are kind of taken aback by the lower output power of Axiom Digital or ULXD, where normally you would have like a 10 milliwatt uh, digital and not, uh, used to have like a 30 or 50 milliwatt uh, analog. Uh, what has been your experiences with uh, transmission distance and, and uh, that sort of thing? Maybe Kirk? Well, I'm really not the right person to talk about that aspect of it because that's generally someone like Brooks comes in and deals with that aspect of it for my show. Mine is more about the uh, networking aspect and how to integrate your system directly into ours. So I would hand that over to Brooks because he's the guy I'd look to and say, hey, how do you want to do this? Um, okay, yeah. Um, I would. I was super surprised the first time I used the ULXD um, at five milliwatts or super low power and how well that would cover the majority of 
smaller ballrooms that you would do with uh, like, like a corporate breakout. Um, and being able to do that then just allows you to stack so many more channels of microphones into that area than before. Um, I think Dave probably has the same experience. It's, it's the amount that you can cover at such low power and not step on your neighbor. Um, and I'm, I'm sure uh, JJ probably has the same experience being in Manhattan where there's theaters next to each other. If everyone can go down to 10 milliwatts, cover just their house, you know, we're not bleeding through walls like we used to. You're not going to get, you know, the random, uh, you know, somebody's outside with a smoke break on the dock door and you're so one of your cast members out having a smoke break at the dock door and all of a sudden you're seeing everybody's microphones come through the, the open doors. Um, that with the lower power in the battery life has just made shows, I think, so much more uh, enjoyable to do. If you're doing a show mm -hmm. that's three or four hours long, you know, you can put a battery in at the top of the show, do a one hour walk in, do a three to four hour show, and you still have an hour left on your battery. You're not sitting there trying to run down your star, or your executive to change their battery every two or three hours. Um, you know, so that ability with the digital microphones has been amazing for me. My first uh, of the debates in this cycle knowing that there were going to be about 500 news gathering organizations outside the venue on top of my 40-ish microphones in the room and being able to run yeah you know, in five years ago whatever i would have been running at high power on axion analog just to make sure being able to run the axion digitals and not see interference from outside and be able to yeah, you know, leave space for the ENG crews was a huge game changer. That's uh, that's a good point. The um, I mean, the range performance. You know, we we've seen uh, like as you mentioned, you know, good good range at less power and that sort of thing. Um, I wondered if uh, you've had any uh, kind of experiences or or maybe hesitant to say issues of like just at the end of range because digital operates a little bit differently than analog where. Uh, with the analog domain, we would talk about something called graceful degradation, basically saying that, you know, the farther away and the signal drops closer to the noise floor, the audio quality suffers. And you'd hear that, like with uh, somebody going out of range with the analog, kind of some wispies or or static hits, and then it starts to sound a little crappy, um, where digital is pretty much just awesome, 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 and then phew, it goes away, kind of like a CD. It works or it doesn't, right, because it's digital. Um, maybe some, have you guys had some experiences uh, with that in range performance with the digital versus analog? I definitely had uh, a project where the dressing rooms ended up very far away from our coverage zone. I think I was running, my closest helical antenna was a 400-foot cable run, and then it was another most of a thousand feet to the uh, dressing room area. And the very last dressing room was at the point where we couldn't test in the dressing room. We had to have them step outside and walk closer towards us. And it was very clear, you know, the moment they stepped into range, okay, great, they're fine, they can go back. But five feet down, and there was nothing at all. Where analog, it, I think we would have seen a lot more of I think I have them. I'm not sure. They might be okay. I think that plays into anything in the digital world. It's the same thing with Ethernet cable. You know, you could have 300 feet, 305 feet on an Ethernet cable, and the network's not working. You cut that five feet off, and it's there and good to go. So it's it's all you know connected. Digital brings that you know to any one of the formats that we work in. That's a good point. Uh, it kind of brings us up to, um, you know, kind of quantifying all of this range and performance characteristics. And historically with analog wireless, we would look at the RSSI or receive signal strength indicator of how much RF you're getting. Um, but, you know, with the addition of Axiom Digital, uh, we have a new meter called the Q meter. And that kind of Q meter lets you know the quality of the signal and not only the amount of the signal, but am I getting the right signal, the right ones and zeros? Am I actually deciphering uh, the, the signal appropriately? where, you know, because we've mentioned previously, it's not any more that proportional with audio quality to signal to noise ratio with digital as much as it is with analog. Um, but we need a way of kind of knowing, hey, is everything working? Uh, is, it, is, it about to, is it about to fail? Is my 
customer or client going out of range uh, and that. Uh, so I'm kind of curious about um, maybe your some experiences working with the Q meter and and uh, you know in comparison to you know observing the, the receive signal strength meter and how that works for you. I would say that's primarily what I look at anymore for a microphone. Um, you know, I want to make sure I have good strong RF levels, but more importantly, I want to make sure that you know my RSSI is where it should be. Um, and th this is gonna—I'm gonna go off industry, um, but I have a really good friend who works for AT&T in the engineering uh, department, and he, for years, would would just curse their marketing because it was all about bars. And he's sitting here putting in you know DAS systems and spending hundreds of millions of dollars going. I'm giving people two bars, but our RSSI level is through the roof, and that's what they want. But we get complaints all the time because there's not enough bars in, in this area, even though they never drop a call. We have all the logs look good. So I, I think that's kind of where we're at now, too. It's like I don't necessarily need to have a microphone on high power and have full RF. If I have stable RF anywhere in my environment I'm trying to cover and my RSSI is solid, I'm good to go. I don't need to go try to run and chase somebody with antenna or try to, you know, put gain in the system, either at the transmitter or an antenna line somewhere like that. So it, it, it also gives you a nice warm feeling because you know that even with an analog microphone, you could have full RF and you're done. So. Yep. I find the Q is a, fluc a significant fluctuation in the Q, even momentary, is the first thing I look for that I have a problem that mm. I need to track down. If the queue is consistent, then things are good. Absolutely. And uh, I'm curious, just curious, Dave, are you using like the front panel or, or workbench or maybe the timeline function uh, to, to see, the, see the queue or, or observe it historically? Typically, uh, workbench, um, and I do as often as possible run the timeline function on at least, you know, key microphones or microphones that I have questions on. If if there's been an issue, I'll keep that one up right in front of me. Sweet. Awesome. What's up, guys? Hey, Jason. Hey, so we've, uh, I feel like we've nailed out quite a bit of this Axiom Digital stuff. I think we can spend a little bit of time here talking about maybe transport systems that, and the transport. We, I know earlier we talked about Dante. Um, I'd like to maybe get into that a little bit more heavily um, in terms of how your workflows changed from an analog perspective to, to Dante. Kirk, I know you mentioned you transitioned um, the Super Bowl over to that. Um, what I, I guess what are the what are the main things that you would tell somebody who's integrating a digital transport system versus an analog to look for um, whether that's that's Dante or or a different one in terms of the the network protocols just basic stuff here uh, we'll start with that well basic stuff I would start with saying that it the downside to going to digital is you really have to have a knowledge of networking systems uh, whether it's Dante or AVB or pick your flavor, even the old school Cobranet, you really have to know how to set up a network. And that's what tends to scare people. You can't just walk out to Best Buy and buy a network switch or two and have a network. Well, you can to an extent if you're only doing a couple of channels. But if you're doing a massive system like I do at Super Bowl, you've got to really manage the system. And that's the downside to uh, going with a digital uh, transport system. The good side is that you can manage the system. Uh, not just from a network point of view, but from an audio point of view, signal flow, you can, it's very easily to manipulate and everything. So there's a lot of advantages and just physical advantages. Now I'm not running hunks of W4 cable that weigh tons and tons and tons and have problems after problems because you're running across things that are inducing noise and things like that. I'm running a piece of fiber that's about the size of an XLR cable. And I'm carrying thousands of channels across that one cable. Again. Back to the downside is that now it's more difficult to troubleshoot when you've got when you've got XLR cables the cable works or it's flaky you can replace the cable you know where it begins where it ends and a digital world is very virtual and you've it's a different workflow a different troubleshooting process to understand where the failures are and how to fix them uh, I I much prefer the digital world because it is so flexible those uh, positives 
by far outweigh the negatives for me, especially when I'm running around a stadium where I've got, man, I've got probably 25, 30 nodes around the stadium in various places that I've got to get to. I can use house fiber. I can use my own fiber. I can use other people's fiber, which I utilize all that every year. Um, so it's just, it's a, to get started, you really have to understand the technology and how to manage it. Uh, there's a lot of great tutorials online about how to do that. So it's not, it's not rocket science, believe it or not. It's just learning it and getting comfortable with it and getting the people who are using it comfortable with it. That's also been a big challenge for me because I've been dealing with network systems for almost 25 years. I'm comfortable with it. I, I understand them. But getting people that don't understand them, getting them comfortable with it has definitely been a big challenge for me. Uh, but that's the future. I mean, it, everybody's putting this uh, backbone in their buildings now that everybody can jump on. Uh, you, you have dark fiber, you have a full on backbone network that you could jump across. There's a lot of options and everything and there's pluses and minuses to it all. So for to say, where do you begin? I would definitely begin by starting to learn the technology, dive into it, immerse yourself in the technology for everything from the network to the actual transport technologies. Awesome. Thanks, Kirk. JJ, I feel like you've got some stuff to add here. Yeah. Well, I kind of I kind of laughed at the, the the comment he made about, you know, the old schoolers and trying to help them transition into the digital world. And, you know, I've worked with sound mixers out there that are the most, you know, I have the utmost respect for. They've mixed shows that I could only dream of working on, right? And they are very, uh, you know, amazing at their at their art. And then all of a sudden you go, okay, so you have to make sure you plug the primary into the primary and the secondary into the secondary. And, you know, if you cross that by accident, you know, it just turns into a, and that's a trunked line. And, and all of a sudden they're like, you know, mind blown. And, and right away it's kind of like, no, 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 give me my knobs back, you know? And and I, I love knobs. I like to turn knobs and make things work that way. That's great. But the challenge has been uh, convincing the old schoolers and people that are really kind of in that analog way to understand that this opens up the whole world of possibilities, you know, um, and to, to get them to trust that. So not just at Carnegie, but other environments that I've worked in, you know, I've been on shows where I was doing an archival recording literally next to a Dante enabled mixer and they wanted to, they, we ended up having an analog run a patch like backstage back and forth and back. And I'm like, we could just take a feed right off the network here and be done. But I didn't want to, you know, get too invasive in what they wanted to do. So I let them do it. But that's the whole thing is they're like, okay, I know I have, you know, a pair of copper tie lines upstage. So we'll just patch that back to front of house. And I'm like, no, we could just grab it off the Dante network right here. But you know, so that bridging that gap, right? So that's one thing, but I, I will say it has definitely expanded and, and made things like we talked about before running lines from trucks. I've been on shows where there was one show in particular where there was so much noise on the lines that, you know, we must've ran a dozen, you know, uh, heavy molts down 10 flights of stairs to the theater and we just couldn't get the noise. It was a problem between grounding of the building and the truck and we were chasing our tails for hours. And um, finally I was, I called up to the truck. I said, do you guys happen to have a Dante card up there? Uh, I forgot what console they were using, but it, 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 it wasn't a Yamaha brand. So I wasn't sure if they had a Dante interface. So I, I rang up, he's like, yeah, we do. I was like, all right, let's just run a piece of fiber and boom, you know, we had 60 Cleaned plus channels, yeah. like yeah. totally clean, you know, and, all that W cable was like, all right, it's there for wall decoration now, right? Um, and that one single piece of tactical fiber just took all the noise out, and we were we were good to go. But um, I, it, it also helps expand. You know, we've had instances at Carnegie where we've done shows where the the uh, house recordist has needed more tie lines for his microphones that he's hanging while he's off in some other room somewhere, and you know, in the past, we'd have to run copper lines all through the hallways, but we have a pair of uh, Ethernet tie lines that go from the stage up to his office. We drop a couple of uh, Dante-enabled 
transceivers and boom, he's picking up. He's again, old schooler. He's all analog. So we just yep. trans, we, we changed that Dante signal into an analog and he patches it analog and he's analog, you know, his, his, uh, Preamps are all analog, you know, the finest preamps there are in the world. But, yep. <laughs> you know, we bring it digital, we send it up to him, and he takes it back to copper. But he gets the joy of plugging it in still. Yeah. It, he does. But, but, and I'm like, you know, there's a Dante card for that, that preamp that you have up there, <laughs> that, that mic preamp. He goes, no, 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 we'll, we'll just, okay. You know, but it, it just makes it easy, you know, easier or more capable. So, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> The digital world, Brooks said it best earlier, it's a different way of thinking. And old dog school, new tricks, you know, th that's kind of where we're at. And, you know, it, I, it's just getting your head wrapped around the new technology that is not something that's been in our industry. I mean, it's, it's really easy for an IT guy to come in and go, oh, well, we just do this, do this, do this. Oh well, yeah, you live in that world. You grew up in that world. The rest of us haven't. We grew up with, as JJ said, you know, analog knobs, analog cables. And even though I've been immersed in it for 20 years, there's still moments where I kind of scratch my head a little bit and go, man, I hope this works. You know, especially a show like Super Bowl, there's no room for failure. I mean, as Brooks can tell you, the referee mic is our mic, and it's accent, and it goes to the world. If you hear it, no matter whether you're on the radio, whether you're on the TV, in the stadium, <laughs> it's our mic. It came from us. You got that yep. signal from me. So if the referee doesn't work, which is one of the most important mics of the game, man, everybody's looking at me going, where is it? And you know now it's a different type of troubleshooting and figuring out, okay, it's coming out of their Dante, it's going here, it's going there. It, it's just you gotta you, you gotta get comfortable with the technology. And it's yeah. just thinking differently. There's there's two big topics I'd like to unpack here that have come up. And and I think the first one is uh, when you have a mission critical situation like you've talked about, um, what how are you handling redundancy in your digital networks? Um, and then the second is, uh, you just started to touch on this, is what is your what is your troubleshooting method for something like that in terms of, like it used to be a cue box, right? Everybody had a cue box in their pocket. Well, that doesn't do any good with the Dante network, right? So um, I guess, what are, what are your two answers to those two questions in terms of redundancy uh, and troubleshooting? Redundancy, we do dual networks. We run two completely separate networks. They don't touch each other. And in Dante world, they can't. You have a primary and a secondary, and they're not allowed to touch either. They actually have to be in different subnets. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, that's the ad addressing scheme. Uh, but it's two completely separate networks, separate cables, everything. So sometimes you're running two cables right beside each other because that's the only way you can get there. But it's two physically different systems. So if one goes down, the other picks up, and hopefully you don't know that anything happened. Uh, when things do start to go around, uh, you know, Odnate has their Dante controller, which gives you quite a bit of information. Uh, we also have a guy who's in charge of patching the Dante, and that's his job. And it, he also has the ability to monitor any signal at any time. So he's tapping in. If someone's saying, hey, this is sounding a little crunchy, you can tap into it and go, yeah, that's the way we're getting it into the system. Then we go back to wherever the source is and try to figure it out from that point of view. That's kind of the delineation for us of is it before the system or in the system? Uh, if you see things dropping on and offline in uh, Dante Controller, then you know you got a network problem. Uh, so then you start look at it again from a different point of view. Do we have a, did we lose a connection between point A, point B? Uh, is are we getting a broadcast storm? Does somebody accidentally plug a cable into a switch and loop it back onto itself? It's essentially a feedback loop uh, for a network. Uh, yep. And boy, that'll take your system down faster than you can imagine. Most network switches nowadays have methods of preventing that. Uh, the other thing is, did you get somebody come along and plug in a lighting controller into your network and now they're oh, flooding yeah. DMX all over your network? Yeah. You, there's there's all kinds of weird things that can happen. And when you're spread out over a stadium, it becomes real challenging and you just kind of have to take it piece by piece depending on the problem. Um, so that's that's kind of where 
I start with it at least and everything. And in smaller systems, it's obviously easier because you have less nodes. You, may, you might have only two nodes. So it's gonna be at that end or that end. There's no in, in between and everything. So that helps. Yeah, I'll agree with uh, with Kirk on the, uh, now we're getting into my thing here uh, with ones and zeros, right? So <laughs> exactly. uh, I'm with you. Uh, Dante controller is your like best friend when it comes to uh, running Dante networks because it really gives you good feedback as to what's going on. And and that's something that you should definitely be familiar with all the way from a systems manager, right? If you're in a, a larger scale show or if you're the A1, A2, you should know that front to back because that's the, you have any problems before you start even ringing out, you know, microphones and look and see what's going on there. I go right to, to Dante controller and see if there's any red flags and it'll tell you, you know, hey, there's a problem, Clockmaster, something's going on. Look at uh, your addresses, right? We, we've had circumstances where people accidentally plug in a DHCP server into the Dante network. Mm -hmm. And now they're all looking for self-assigned IPs and now all of a sudden they're getting IP addresses. So all of a sudden, you know, the, the devices that should be self-assigned have an address and it's like, okay, I, I don't see that uh, IO device anymore. Well, because it thinks it's part of another network, right? So that is your uh, that is your best friend, Dante Controller. And then yeah, to, go I ahead, think I'm Ben sorry. has a photo real quick. I was just going to have him pop up and show um, Dante Controller, and but continue your conversation while we while we bring that up here. Sure. So Dante Controller is your uh, your 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 best friend that I mentioned about that. Uh, going back to the separate networks thing, um, you know, some people I don't know. Uh, some people here are VLANs, right? So it's like virtually splitting a, a a switch into two different switches. That's good for, you know, like a small breakout room and you want to run primary and secondary, but it really isn't truly redundant at that point, right? Because if that single switch dies, you lose both LANs, right? So uh, at Carnegie, we have full redundant, totally completely separate. We actually have three networks, uh, two Dante networks, primary and uh, se secondary, and a control network. So we try and keep as much of the control noise, you know, off either one of those Dante networks as well. There are some devices that require to have control on that, uh, on that secondary network, but uh, yeah. we try and move all of that, you know, iPad to control the desk information is all happening on a third network so that there's no crosstalk there. And I, and I understand it was like, oh, Dante bandwidth is so low and it's really not using that much bandwidth. It's just a matter of really like closing in the network and securing it and making sure that no one accidentally has the ability to, you know, pop in a, uh, you know, a bit torn <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> they're like chewing up all this noise, you know, so. Uh, uh, well, lime wire action for those of you old enough to remember that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so to shut that down, you know, port security, literally, uh, all of our Dante switches have um, security grates over the front of them. Uh, hey, JJ. Yes. How much multicast do you guys do at Carnegie, if you don't mind me asking? Great Zero. Uh, good question. Okay. Zero, only because of the fact that we don't have that many subscriptions where we need to enact multicast. Uh, okay. Once you say that multicast word, I get chills because again that's a whole nother animal to manage it, that's the beast that i deal with constantly because i've got a route like i'll go back to the ref mic it, i've got 30 places i have to route that i have yep. to multicast that and yeah, so I, the, you know, that's the other side of it that for, for those of you guys who do not understand we uh, what we're nice. talking about you have unicast which is point to point uh not network traffic and you have multicast which is one a single uh source to many receivers so you can do that. So when you're doing the multicast, it can swamp your network really fast. So you have to really think about your trunk ports and stuff like that. I actually had to upgrade all of my uh, trunk ports to 10G. Uh, thank goodness the price has come down. I could do it. So now I got plenty of, because I was swamping out uh, my trunk ports on switches. I never swamped out endpoints, which are the actual device ports, but I was swamping out the trunk ports, which go between the switches uh, with multicast traffic. So I went to Tenji. Now I've got the room, the bandwidth to deal with it. Uh, but those are things you have to think about in a large scale system of, you know, you know and you're right. I, it makes me cringe too when we start talking multi, or it used to, 
But with the added bandwidth now, with the technology available and the cost, uh, the affordability of the technology, it's easy for me to throw 10G in there and I'm using maybe 4% of a 10G trunk. And I'm like, okay, you can multicast whatever you want, go for it. But you yep. do have to think about those things. And those are the little gotchas that'll get you if you don't understand the system. Exactly. Um, right. And that's why you have to make sure you lay out a good floor plan of what you, who needs to subscribe to what. You know, at most we'd have, you know, front of house monitors and maybe a recordist. So at the most, there'll be three people subscribing to that one channel, right? Maybe four. Um, but when you start to get into larger scale events like the Super Bowl, where you have to send it out to 30, now all of a sudden you have 30 single streams happening and that's going to end up choking the network. So that's why you convert to multicast. And then this way you're putting it out there and anybody who wants to pick it up can. But once you start moving into that world, it puts a whole other workload on your, your network, like you had mentioned. Right. And you should see my napkin drawing I do every year. Okay, I got this node and I'm receiving 15 channels here and I'm sending four. Okay, that's four flows coming in and one flow going out. Okay, because th there is a limitation in Dante and I, I'm getting real technical here and I apologize. You only have 32 flows across a one gig uh, line. Uh, it, it doesn't matter which way the flows are. You can only have 32, period. And each flow is four channels. So you guys sit there and count your channels, and, and you got to think about where they originate from because flows are based on where they originate from. You could have two channels coming from one place. It still counts as a four-channel flow. So you've got to really lay it out, and, and, and you have to spend days just staring at this going, okay, i got to walk away for a minute and get a cup of coffee because my head's going to explode. And then come back to it. And, and just try to dive in and make sure that I got all my uh, I's dotted, my T's crossed, because I don't want to get on site and plug in and have everything go sideways because I missed that. Oh, I exceeded my flow count. Oh, crud. I got to go back and figure out how to. Now I got to fix it on the fly. Um, and that's hard to do. And I think that kind of to tie it back to like Shure or any, any uh, manufacturer out there, right? You have to make sure your network's solid before you start saying, oh, this, I'm not using Dante for this piece of junk because it doesn't work. It, it could, it may not be the device. It, good chances are it's it's your network infrastructure um, and the way that you have your network laid out and the device is working on that network. There's also something, uh, you're familiar with Dante Domain Manager? Um, that's yeah, another, uh, for like the install side, um, Dante Domain Manager actually is a tool for everybody out in the listening to this is a tool that you can use to lock down that Dante network so that, you know, when someone decides to come in and plug something in, I mean, of course, at the end of plugging in a DHCP server, that's a different animal. But I'm, what I'm saying is that they want to come in and start messing with your patch and your Dante network. I mean, you could walk up to a Dante network that's open, plug in Dante controller and start changing all the XYs. Um, right. With Dante Domain Manager, it makes it so you have to have a username and password in order to get in and make any of those changes. And you can set rights and all that kind of stuff. Dante Controller, one thing to heed warning here is Dante Controller is a great tool, but it, it get a really big screen and have a really good mouse because yeah. you're, you're patching like little dots, you know, and it looks like the Sunday Times, you know, crossword puzzle sometimes. And you tick one box over the wrong way on the <laughs> XY, the next thing you know, you know, the, the president's microphone is going to the, you know, the restaurant down the street by accident, you know, that kind of thing. There's a, so, there's a nice graphic there of uh, a, a fairly large Dante network. Kirk, I think that came from you, right? Is that Atlanta Super Bowl? Uh, maybe. Uh, Should be able to oh, see it. Atlanta. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Jen. Hey, hey just Atlanta, okay. Yeah. They, they all run together. I mean, because they all look the same. I mean, it, it's just... It's it's crazy. I mean, it, when you're dealing with that many channels, and by the way, all those are minimized. So you start clicking on the pluses, and this thing starts doing this, and you're going, oh, scroll, 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 scroll. I mean, I, I'd love to have two 70-inch LED screens there just to stretch it out across them. Uh, but it's, it's very it's, – it's crazy when you start really looking at it all and trying to make it all work and, and flow right. Um, it's, but again, it's not, you have to look at these digital systems from a simplistic point of view. You've got to, otherwise it's so overwhelming. You got to just take bite-sized chunks. 
And okay, I'm having a problem at the our entertainment front of house. Okay, well, let's focus on that rack first and figure out, is it a cable problem? Is it a switch problem? Is it a device problem? Um, and, you know, kind of looping back, and that's one of the great things that uh, I think that Shure has done with these new uh, digital microphones is give you the Dante ability because now you're into this world and I can route these wherever I want with a click. As JJ was saying, with the click of a mouse, man, I can put it wherever. And it's so easy to deal with. Now I, I'm not looking at Brooks going, hey, you're out of out of lines on your W2, buddy. Uh, you're adding more mics, really? So now I got to run more W2, 450 feet? Thanks, dude. You know, it, well, can we jump on that too? Is I mean, we've dealt with this where Super Bowl, you're on site for three weeks, four weeks out in the elements a lot of times and how many times did we'd come in in the morning and it would have been you know 60 degrees and then 90 degrees and you know the w2s w4s you get moisture in them and it's you know you spend an hour taking apart connectors and cleaning everything and trying to find where you got that buzz and you know with dante that gone. problem of audio is gone which is great it works or it doesn't yeah yeah and I'm sure that uh, having the agility of the frequencies and stuff helps you in a big environment like that too. How many frequencies were, when you were doing that with us, how many frequencies were on game day coordinated? Uh, well, for the for the entertainment side of it, uh, no, no, the last total. one, total, uh, I think Carl Voss is the last one I worked with him. I think he was up to about 3000 frequencies from you know, a UHF spectrum. And that's across, everything inside the stadium with two-way radios all the way up to the broadcasters 900 meg stuff so um so this is where I'll, your magic comes in and the and the new technology that sure is introduced that helps us fit into environments like that and and that's yeah. that's real it, that's really key and, and it's not just super bowl i mean the grammys is the same way the oscars is the same way uh jj as you say you know you get the same shows that i deal with coming through carnegie and it's you just you know, it just feels like it's almost a wild, wild west out there uh, sometimes trying to deal with shoehorning your microphones in and out. And, and, I, and I'm a system guy, but I look over like Brooks. I've looked over Brooks's shoulders many times watching what he's doing. And I shake my head and go, that's voodoo. I, I got to walk away because it's going to make my head explode. But he does, you know, that's but that's his specialty. So. And and one of the nice things about the digital microphones is, you know, before when you'd have multiple events happening, either in, in the stadium, in the bowl, outside the stadium, in the parking lot, you know, you had, you know, it didn't take a lot of analog signal to interfere with your analog signal, right? You could get artifacts on top of it. The digital microphones, if, if, you, if you can be high enough over it, you can be co-channel sharing with somebody outside in the parking lot and you're never going to know it. Until you turn your microphone off and you're like, oh, there's somebody under there. Your, your microphone, as long as you have that RSI level above what they are, you're never going to know it. You're not going to start hearing the auctioneer from across the street trying to sell cars while you're trying to do a corporate meeting next door. Um, that ability in a crowded environment, I think, is amazing. And it's, it's really helped, I think, everybody get the full potential out of their microphones without as many issues as we used to have with the analogs. So. Dave, do you have anything to add? I saw you kind of lean forward. Uh, no, I think it's been covered at this point. All right, cool. Um, out of curiosity, since we talked about wireless channels on the Super Bowl, how many Dante channel, how many Dante patches is a, is a Super Bowl, roughly? You know what? I, I'd have to do some math to even come remotely close. I know that our multicast bandwidth alone is uh, is just under 800 megs. Uh, and that's not including all the unicast. Uh, so that gives you an idea of how crazy that is. I mean, if you're working on a gig network, you, you're hosed. I, I tried it. I mean, I... well. 
we tipped we tiptoed into conversion to Dante. I mean, because uh, we started out. I think I mentioned earlier we started out with Cobra Nets, and there was a whole bunch of different networks, and we mimicked that at first with Dante. And then I started combining these networks in smaller chunks, and then just creating a bigger and bigger. And then finally, about three years ago, I made it one big network, uh, just because of the nature of that event. And there, and it's a long day, and it's there's no room for failure. Of uh, everything is live all day long. I, I didn't want to risk just diving in head first and and doing it all one big network. So uh, it, it's. It's grown over the years, so it's really this. That's an example of uh, an amp position in Atlanta up in the catwalks. So you've got a couple fibers coming in, and then you got XLR cables patching to your amplifiers with AES on them. I mean, it's simplified everything so much. There's my AES cables are relatively short, and there's just not a lot of room for noise to be induced. Well, it's even AES, so you don't even really get noise, I and mean, you can get interference and just be dropping ones and zeros. But there's just not a lot of room for failure when you're when you've consolidated like this, uh, unlike the analog days. Um, so it's just simplifying everything as much as I can. But the, the network is just it's just absolutely huge. And I ran into the point when we went to the big network that you know I've got 700 megs of multicast. I, I've got to, I, I can't do that on a gig. I've used up my entire gig. And unlike JJ, uh, we run two networks. Uh, we don't run three. Uh, we, we include our control on the primary side because that's just the nature of the way everything works uh, in our system. So we do have that overhead of the control aspect of it, but it's not that much. I mean, you know, I, I run wireless workbench so that uh, our monitor engineer, Tom Pisa, can monitor his in ear. Uh, transmitters uh, that are in Brooks's world or whoever the RF coordinator is. Uh, so I, I'm running that over the network. I'm, I'm doing all, I'm doing a lot of things on top of the Dante. Uh, and that was just a sacrifice we decided to make because the, the expense of adding a third network because it's, we're not VLANG, we're physically different networks plus the cable infrastructure and everything was just, and we did our measurements uh, and we were able to uh, just do it. There's our wireless position, and you can see our over on the right side is our uh, red net rack for analog uh, performance mics that artists may request. And then we've got the digital stuff that just goes straight into the Dante network. So, hey, Kirk, can I jump in? Because you said sure. something earlier, and uh, JJ kind of mentioned too. I found it as not being the network guy or the, the system guy on a show, but just providing sins to it or, or taking out. Um, it, I find it's really important for a production or a, a venue to have one person managing the Dante. Like JJ said, anyone can plug in Dante controller if you're not locked down and start moving stuff. And people, it, it's dynamic. So you can move things at the same time with other people. And I have been on shows where the world has come apart because there's been someone in a truck changing something at Dante and somebody in front of the house changing something at Dante and somebody in modern world changing Dante. And all of a sudden, all these people are trying to do something and you now you have to spend hours trying to undo and remap because something got changed and somebody moved something and there wasn't an overall global person going, I'll make these changes to make sure that we're not taking something from where it's not supposed to and, and do that. Right. Oh, now it's I will, Super Bowl. Um, yeah, at Super Bowl, we have two people that patch, and that's it. And I'm neither. I will look over the shoulder and say, okay, we need to put this to there and that to there, but I, I don't touch it because those two people are the only two people that can do it. Now, one other thing we do at Super Bowl is that – hang on just a second. I'll jump in and say that I, uh, I fully I agree there has to be a uh, – one person who's the Dante master, everybody has to be on board before you start. If one of the engineers involved says, oh, yeah, you're the Dante master, but I know better, I'm gonna do it myself, that you're just gonna have a lousy week. Well, the the two guys, they have their different areas. Uh, one guy is our entertainment system patch and the other guy is everything else patch. And sometimes they cross over, but they talk immediately to each other. Hey, I need to make this patch. Are you okay with that? So they they really are talking to each other directly. But 
the one thing that I do too is I do not interface directly with other people's Dante systems. For instance, uh, uh, CBS truck has, they had a huge Dante, their Dante system was as big as mine. Uh, but I did a Maddie patch across the two for two reasons. One, I don't have to worry about them controlling my system or me controlling theirs. I break that. And two, it's a clock. In digital, we have to worry about a clock. The clock is everything. It's like power in an audio system. You, it either works or it doesn't work. If, the, if, you, if you don't get the power right in an analog system, you can't fix anything else in the system. The clock is that way in a digital system. If the clock is bad or you got multiple clocks and nobody knows what to sync to, then you've got a bigger problem. Sorry, somebody keeps calling and it's spam calls and I hate these guys. Uh, they, uh, you've got to, um, if you don't have the clock right, you're bad. So in my world, I want to control my own clock. I want my system to be clocked the way I want it to be clocked and not reliant upon anybody else. For instance, the production truck after the halftime show, they pull the power and they start disconnecting. And if so if I'm slave to their clock, then it then I'm hosed after halftime. Uh, the TV truck, if I'm tied to them, they stay on after us. So when I start pulling my stuff off, it messes with them. So I have my entire system is isolated. I have Maddie jumps in between systems because I can sample rate those and I don't have to worry about clock. I don't have to worry about control. So that's the way that I deal with the control aspect. And Dave, you're right. You have to have one guy that's a master. In my case, just because of the nature of my system, it's so big, it's hard for one guy to do it, especially on Sunday morning when you've got 50 people coming in saying, hey, I know I told you this, but I really need this. No, I'm, can I have this over here and can I have that? One person's head would explode. So I got two people that are going, okay, I got, I got him, you take him. And so they're coordinating and they're repatching and doing everything. And I don't know why they can't come in on Saturday and do it, but they always come in on Sunday and do it right as we're about to go on the air. And you're going, dude, really? It's a little late in the game here. But it's just the nature of the beast. You have to deal with it. You can't say, no, that's not an option. So you've got to make it work. And so that's why I try to keep as much control. I'm a control freak is the way I would consider it. I'm a control freak when it comes to my network. I don't want anybody on it that I don't know is on it. And it, just because any little thing can take you down. And when it takes you down, it's not as easy to troubleshoot as we've talked about. You've got to find the problem and what they did and how they did it and undo it. And so it's just, it's a really big thing. And and in smaller systems, it's much easier. You know, like uh, on a normal show when I've got three nodes, man, that's, e that's much easier to troubleshoot. You still get yourself tied in a knot, but it's much easier to troubleshoot because I only got three nodes. When I got 30 and it takes me 20 minutes to get from one node to another because the elevators are full and I got to take the stairs and I'm dying by the time I get up to four or six from floor one on the stadium. It, you're, you just, it takes you forever just to get around and to get to do things. So as much as I, as, if I can keep everybody's fingers out of it. And we actually had A2s who wanted to jump on with um, – the focus right software and control the preamps remotely and i'm like nope you have a knob right there on the front of the unit use that i'm not letting you on the network sorry and they're they understood and they okay great they were able to do it it didn't hinder them from their job but it would have been easier for them to sit in one place and control them all around the field as opposed to having to run around the field and do it manually but that's just that's a sacrifice that i had to make that hey i'm sorry i can't be convenient to you but I can't risk letting you on the network and then you decide unbeknownst to me to open up Dante controller and start doing things. Uh, that would really be a problem. So Sorry. a question came in. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to add to that, but what, what are you using for a master clock? I, I let the Dante network figure its own clock out normally. Uh, in, in a, in permanent install, it's a different story. Uh, there, there are several Dante-based clocks out now, uh, which are really cool. And we've been looking at them potentially for our show environment, but hey, they're really expensive. And uh, 
we need more work on it, uh, uh, more testing before I'd even consider rolling things out. Well, we've had pretty good luck with just letting the Dante system figure out its own master. Uh, and sometimes I have to direct it a little bit because I always like to keep it as a redundant unit, primarily if possible, uh, just because it's not the one on the air and, and it can do that duty as well as everything else because it's not really doing much else. It's just you know, primarily dealing with the clock and saying, okay, I'm standing by, I'm, I'm not really doing anything. Uh, but that's the way that I deal with it. I, I don't, we haven't gone down the road of having a, a single master clock on the digital network, uh, on the Dante network yet. Possibly coming, but there's more to, it's relatively new and it's, it's something that I'm not comfortable doing yet. Um, I, I need to research that a little bit more. Are the rest of you doing the same regarding the Dante clock or do you have a dedicated master? I work with the uh, Dante, the self-assigned Dante clock. Mm -hmm. There've been discussions on some very large projects to go to a dedicated master, but it hasn't proven to be necessary. Same here. Okay. Perfect. Uh, as the RF guy on the show, I don't want somebody to be able to say that I did something else wrong. So I'll let somebody else handle the clocking for that. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Perfect. Um, actually, there was a question that came in uh, for you, Brooke specifically, I think. Uh, I think of your LA um, coordination and asking what you ended up using TV channel wise in the LA area? Well, this was uh, seven years ago. Um, so it's probably not there anymore. Um, I want to say it was in the J range, uh, J50 range. And it was, uh, we were at um, right downtown. So I think it was probably, we were probably getting it at like minus 80. Um, and we were able to, to get the ULXD handhelds up above it enough to pass good audio. Um, what TV channel that was, I don't know. Um, you know, downtown LA, much like downtown most places, um, there's not a lot of low-level DTV when you're outside anymore. So um, I probably would not have been able to get away with it nowadays. That's great. Um, this is awesome. Um, we had a couple questions pop in. I think this one's just for Brooks. Uh, somebody asked if you're swapping out an analog system for a digital system, are there any antenna things that I need to make sure of? Uh, your gain structure of your antennas. Um, the, the digital microphones work great and you don't need to amplify them as much as some of the old analog systems that get through cable. Um, if you're gonna keep, you can keep your same low loss cable, you can keep your same antennas. Um, just make sure that if you are if you have an active antenna or you have a line amp in line that you, you're using that, you're doing the math to make sure that you're not going to over amplify. Um, Cause as we talked with the digital, the RSSI side of it, it's just not about level, it's about the quality of that signal and the ones and zeros coming in. And if you, gain something up too high, just like with analog audio, if you crank a preamp, you're not going to get what you need out the other side of it. So it's really important to make sure that your your gain throughout your antenna system is uh, unity and you're not, you know, gaining something up 10, 15 dB. Great point. Uh, another kind of uh, question came up and I know everybody's, uh, you know, concerned about, um, you know, sanitation with the, the COVID situation and that sort of stuff. Um, so people were asking about, um, you know, if you're not sharing transmitters, you're using multiple transmitters, perhaps with a single receiver channel. Um, maybe, I don't know, Brooks or Dave, you might want to talk about workflow as far as having multiple transmitters associated to a single receiver channel in the digital world. Dave, you want to? I, I certainly try to avoid it whenever possible. I, if the show is something that is, let's say, mission critical, then the transmitter should have a dedicated receiver. If it's a budget requirement, you have to pick what compromise you want to make. And the, the last time I did a shared um, transmitter to receiver, 
the only way I was willing to do it is I had to have both transmitters in my hand, power one off, power the other on myself. And that that was the rule I set with the producer to make sure that we didn't have an issue. Uh, cool. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, what I'll do if I'm going to use multiple transmitters on the receiver is, luckily with rechargeable batteries, I give the A2s or I'm doing it one battery. So you get one battery for that channel, um, and that's your battery. So you, you know, someone else has to hold it and do it, and you have that battery to put in there. Um, the other thing I will say, with the enhanced accidents, um, I've done some consulting for some churches and like school theaters where they they do that because this person, this part of a show will do certain things, and you can mute and unmute those extra transmitters via workbench. Um, so the A1 at front of house will physically go, okay, this guy walked off stage, his microphone's off, we're gonna turn this microphone on. And the receivers and workbench is smart enough and intelligent enough to go, hey, this is still on, what do you wanna do? There's gonna be a conflict, which um, is, is a great tool if you're going to or have to do a, a shared situation like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's really nifty. You can just hit activate and it'll mute everything else and activate that one channel, even though it's on the same frequency. So uh, that, that's a cool thing. Um, a question came up on the networking side of things, uh, maybe for JJ or Kirk or both. Um, they were curious about how you typically set up your network and subnets. I mean, are you using a 192.168, you know, dot one for your control and dot two for primary? Uh, I mean, it's personal preference, of course, but I just uh, for your organization, how do you uh, how do you stay organized with your your subnetting for Dante? For for us, we wanted to keep it simple because we know that not all of our guys are IT guys. And so we let, the, Dante has protocols for that. Uh, if you let, networking has protocols called, has a protocol called zero comp, means that there's zero configuration. It's really meant for say like grandma and grandpa just trying to get their laptop working with their print, their network printer in their house. You can plug it in and it zero comps out to a 169.254 subnet. Uh, and in the Dante world, when you do that, uh, the primary will will be in that 169.254 subnet, but the secondary, I think it's 72.10 subnet or 72.20, something like that, will be the will be the secondary subnet because the secondary and the primary cannot be in the same subnet. So Audinate has already kind of figured all that out for you. So you don't have to have a DHCP server and you don't have to have static IP addresses. You can just plug it in. And for us, that made it work great because we could plug all our amplifiers into the primary network as well as the Dante and it all zeros comps out to the 169.254 subnet. And you don't have to worry about IP addresses. And that's the, the that was the easiest way we could do it without teaching everybody and or having to manage IP addresses. And when you're dealing with hundreds of amplifiers and you know tens of devices, that's just a lot of IP addresses that you gotta figure out and deal with. So we just let it zero comp out is the easiest way that we, we set our networks up for. I think uh, there's a, a clear line between, is it an install or is it uh, an event or a one-off or a short run? So in an installation environment, you're dealing with typically an IT managed network, right? And you only have a certain, and if you're operating on their network, they're gonna tell you what you can use, right? And and that's when you start to get into the configuration. And then typically those units are installed and they live in that rack in perpetuity. Whereas when you're doing a road show or something that's up and down, um, it's never in the same configuration, things change, you have to swap things out. So if you start getting into doing dedicated IP addresses for your Dante networks, you have a failure and you got to swap a box out. Now you got to get in there and make sure you assign the right IP address, make sure it's all configured correctly. Uh, whereas if you leave it in that zero conf configuration that Kirk was talking about, it's it's a lot easier to get a new device into the network quickly and not have to worry about managing its IP address and all that other kind of stuff. So that's typically the way we run as well. And uh, and it and it and it also kind of helps um, identifying, like I had mentioned before, about plugging a DHCP server accidentally into a a network. And I only know that from personal experience that all of a sudden, wait, I'm missing three Rios. Where where are these Rios? Like they're gone. I don't understand. So go into Dante Controller and I look and I see, oh, they have 10.0 addresses. Well, that's the control network's 
uh, DHCP range. I said, so someone must have patched the control network cable into the Dante primary network. I know what the problem is. It all it took was a reboot of the Rio and we were good to go and realize, okay, there's that patched cable. So, um, you know, that's another reason, you know, a downside to using that zero config because they're kind of just waiting to receive addresses at that point. So it, it could potentially be more volatile in that way, right? Whereas if they are all static IPs, even if you do plug in a DHCP server, it could affect devices that are looking for an address. But those devices that are fixed, they're not going to pick up something they're not supposed to. So they'll still be there, right? Uh, so it has its ups and, and downs. But I think in our, and, and we're coming from like a, you know, we're loading it in, we're doing it, we're loading it out, it's going somewhere else, it, you know, we're about to go on air. We got to swap out this device. You know, we're in that hot and heavy environment, so that zero conf really helps uh, in in our particular circumstance, right? And then on our control side, we use a 10.0.0. whatever network, just because it's faster to type in. Uh, I don't <laughs> have a specific reason for that, uh, and that's you know what we use for our control devices and those are all static ips with a small range of dhcp addresses one because we have a ton of devices that are controllable on that network uh both within the audio department but video department and lighting department so that we can communicate uh together because it all works on you know one production wi-fi network if you want to control the lights from a remote control they log in that way but um um, we make that all static with a small DHCP range. Just if somebody rolls in with their laptop and they're like, oh, I want to run that Yamaha console, you know, there's like five or six addresses that they can get doled out so they don't have to go in and type in. But uh, that's kind of where we're at uh, with uh, the two uh, options. I find it really interesting that both of you guys have talked about the zero conf and how that is, you know, in, in the situation where, you know, you have to go on stage or something needs to be swapped out, that is the way to go. And and uh, it makes total sense. I mean, uh, you know, learning my, my home network and things, you know, I started with a static IP and, you know, because you put things in and, and so forth. But in a production situation, if you had to do that, you have to go to the device and then put the new static in to swap out. And the same thing with the DHCP reservations, like a DHCP server could be set up, but if you have to swap that gear out of last minute, now you got to go to the DHCP server and redo the, the Mac, uh, you know, reservations and so forth. So uh, it makes total sense of why, why you would do it that way and, and uh, in a run and gun kind of keep it, keep the show moving. Uh, everything must go on quickly without, without a hitch. So uh, that's super valuable. Um, another question came in about uh, output power. Uh, so we talked a little bit about this before. Uh, you know, the digital output powers are less than analog uh, in the Axiom digital realm. You know, we're using two, ten, thirty-five, forty, even twenty, typically. Um, they were curious about what is your go-to output power. Uh, do you do you always set it on high or medium or low, or, or what's your approach to that with a digital wireless? Uh, my approach to it is what it was with analog as well, is I use the lowest amount of power I need um, to, to get the job done. Um, uh, when you're in a high noise environment and you have a lot of frequencies, you're just going to cause more problems by upping your output power. Um, you know, you get battery life issues. Um, in analog, you would have increased intermod issues. Um, so, you know, the, the nice thing about the newer gear, and even you know a PSM 1000, which is analog piece of gear, you can run it on low power, and it's going to cover most rooms or arenas. I mean, I, I'll run 10 milliwatts on a PSM 1000 and cover an arena if you're you know get your antenna high enough, and there aren't any issues. So, to me, I would say I always start as low as I need to, and then if I have to boost up, boost up. Um, same thing if I have to double mic people, I'll start them both low, and I'll you know if I need to. To make myself feel better, or if you think I'll, you know, one at a time, I'll, I'll put the primary on high and leave the secondary on low, so on and so forth, just to kind of keep the noise floor down. Yeah, same, you know, as little as you can get away with. See if you can fix the problem some other way before you go up to high power. It seems to be the, re the recurring theme with wireless, uh, just enough to make it work and, you know, not over boosting, not over. Uh, you know, saturating the environment with excess power that you don't need and so forth. It's just, you're you're doing yourself a disservice, of course, right, by making the spectrum more polluted and uh, more difficult to put more mics in. Um, 
So it brings us to our last kind of fun question. We've been doing some uh, some cool stuff. We've been asking our, our panelists, uh, what is your favorite Sure project, uh, product? You know, your Desert Island, one Sure item that you would have with you if you could pick one from the Sure portfolio. Uh, we'll start with JJ. Put me on the put me on the spot here, huh? Thanks. Uh, I would say um, Showlink is pretty is pretty awesome. You know, um, again, I don't I don't want to put the RF coordinators out of out of business over here, Brooks. You know, I, I uh, only only reason being is because I'm the ones and zeros guy, so that kind of you know uh, gets me excited about about things, right? Um, but there always still needs to be somebody managing it, right? You can't just let it run on its own. So the RF guys are back in the picture again. But the the point is, is that uh, it's pretty it's pretty wild to see that you know work um, and to get the feedback. Like I know my battery is good. You know I'm getting feedback now. I know that was available in previous products, but I just feel like a little bit more confidence in it now because of the amount of two way interaction that's happening there. So that's uh, that's that's pretty slick. Cool. Hey, Dave, how about you? Uh, well, the fun answer is an SM58 because everyone needs a hammer. Realistically, the Axiom Digital is my go-to. It's awesome. And Kirk? I agree with Dave. Axiom Digital, just because it's versatility for me in the system, is definitely where I would go. It, it just it makes life so much easier for me on the big shows and things. So that's where I'd go with that. Brooks? Uh, I, I don't. I don't take any offense to the show link comment either, because I use show link too. Because as a coordinator, if I need to change something, not having to interrupt, it would be great. But uh, I'd go Action Digital platform, the Action Digital platform, being able to scale it with the same receiver, change out a transmitter if you need a microtransmitter or need enhanced or not enhanced. Um, the ability, you know, for ordering or getting gear in from a sub rental house or installs, it's it's really easy to kind of scale that up and say, okay. You know, for our, our background vocalist, we're going to do a standard, you know, AD microphone. And then for someone more important, we'll do an ADX or, you know, an ADFD, one of those things. So that'd be fine. Awesome. Well, you know, this has been so much fun uh, for myself and uh, a lot of our participants. We've been getting a lot of comments in the chat about how this has been uh, great info and, and people have been enjoying it. Uh, so uh, thank you for this. Uh, before we close it out, we have a few uh, points of housekeeping to to cover. Uh, so uh, we want to discuss, just let you know about our Pro Tech Talk every other Tuesday, uh, the first and third Tuesday of the month. Uh, you can join the Sure Market Development team where we're just going to have an open forum, bring your questions. Uh, we'll talk about a certain topic kind of loosely, but, you know, we can go deep down that rabbit hole and crack open that can of worms uh, all the way uh, so it's a lot of fun and come nerd out with us if you're if you're interested um, additionally to the pro tech talk uh, we have uh, we talked earlier about the uh, sure switch to digital which has been extended through the end of this month uh, if you're interested in upgrading to digital and you haven't done so yet uh, you can save anywhere from a hundred to six hundred dollars per channel depending on what you purchase uh, and you don't have to send anything in it's not a rebate you just basically get a straight-up discount uh, and encouraging you to kind of use more spectrally efficient gear so uh, check it out. The link is here, uh, sure.com uh, in US, switch to digital, or just Google switch to digital, sure, and uh, you'll see it come right up in the details of the program. Uh, lastly, uh, we have our July webinars. Uh, of course, today is making the switch from analog to digital, which was awesome. Uh, next week, uh, Friday, is going to be a broadcast monitor mixing. Uh, so this is going to be pretty cool. We have some uh, some all-stars from the Grammy monitor team with Mike Parker, Tom Pesa, Andres Arango, and Billy McCarge, uh, which will be kind of going through their workflow about monitor mixing, which is, which is excellent and a lot of fun. And then, of course, uh, on Friday, July 31st, we're going to talk a little bit about all these concerts that have been happening with the COVID situation. Uh, with drive-in concerts and how that's working from a from a workflow and sure audio perspective. Um, so uh, a lot of cool stuff. We try to keep the topics fresh and relevant to what you guys are, are uh, looking for, and uh, we're very happy to, to do it. So once again, I want to thank our panel, uh, JJ, Dave, Kirk, Brooks. Um, thank you very much for joining us. It's been really informative. Uh, also, our team behind the scenes: uh, Jen, Jason, uh, Bill, uh, Nick. Mark, everybody else uh, from the Sure team that made this happen. Um, and with that, thank you very much, and uh, I hope you have a great rest of the weekend. Take care, everybody.